Well, this morning, um, as you know, we are in the middle of our recommitment month, and um, so we are in the middle of looking at our mission, our, our purpose, our mission statement as a church. Again, since this is our recommitment month, we thought it would be a good idea to just go through and again look at who we are as a church, what exactly we are recommitting to, and what we feel or how we feel God is leading us uh, going into the future, what he wants us to be, what he wants to look, us to look like as his church here in Highland, Indiana. And so I don't know about you, but I'm actually, I've been really excited uh, throughout this series, and I'm excited this morning, and no, it's not because I get to preach, because I'm excited about that every week, but I'm excited because I want to know what God wants for me. I want to know what God wants uh, for us as a church. I want to know who we are as a church, as his church here in this community, knowing our purpose, knowing our mission. This is a blessing. It helps us to, to understand who we are, what plans God has for us as a church, what he wants us to be and do as his church here again in Highland, and helping us to understand who we're supposed to be in our context, according to our makeup, according to who each and every one of us here today fellowshipping together. This is a blessing. And we can only be and we can only become the church that God desires for us to be and become when we're all committed together to going in the direction that God is leading us. The better we know and the better we understand where he's leading us, the better we can fall in behind him the better we can know his plans, the better we can serve his will and his purposes. The better church we can all be together. And this is exciting. It's exciting, and when you actually think about it, it's freeing. When we know why we exist, when we know our purpose, the purpose that God has for us, when we know what our mission is, then we're not going to be floundering around in the dark. We won't be blindly stumbling towards some undefined goal. When we know who we are, when we know who we're supposed to be, then we can boldly step out in faith, yes, but boldly step out and work towards what we know together that God desires for us. And it's truly freeing to be united around a commonly known and understood purpose. And that's why we have this mission statement, is so we can have this commonly known and commonly understood mission. And so as we've discovered throughout our series, our understanding of our mission, it's based on these two foundational texts. Again, the great commandment and the great commission. The great commandment, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, all that we understand about our mission and purpose, it's all grounded on this foundation. Based on a relationship of love with God, the love that God has for us, the love that we have for our neighbors, flowing from that relationship that we have with God. Based on our charge to go out in love and preach the gospel to all nations. We understand that our mission here at Suburban Bible Church is to share the gospel, build disciples, and care for the community. And when we have this understanding together, this, this, this mission that God has given us, here in this context, here in Highland, our vision, when we're living this out together in community, it looks like this, to share the gospel with the world, build disciples by training and teaching, and care for the community through outreach, all for the glory of God. And so far in the last two weeks, 
We've looked at what it means from Scripture to share the gospel and to build disciples. Sharing the gospel, again, it's evangelism. It's preaching the good news to the world. And as a church, we're committed to teaching and training, to equipping, to supporting, to encouraging each other as we all go out into the world to share the gospel in our community. And as well, we're committed to supporting ministries and missions, both inside and outside of our congregation, who are working towards that same purpose, to share the gospel throughout the world. And then as we saw last time, we're also committed to building disciples. Building disciples, discipleship, it's about becoming a committed follower of Christ. It's about learning and doing, as we saw last time, learning what God desires and then putting it into practice. And so as a church, our mission involves first being disciples, then being disciple makers, again through sharing the gospel in the world, and being disciplers, helping each other and growing towards Christ-likeness in our fellowship together. And so this morning then, we're going to be looking at what Scripture teaches about the third aspect of our mission statement, care for the community. And so I know the slides aren't working right now, so if you follow the outline in the bulletin, that'll help you follow along as well. And so the question that we need to ask is, what does it mean to care for the community? What does it mean to care for the community, and how do we go about doing this? And see, this question, as I, as I thought about it, as I studied and prayed about it, this question has a lot of answers, and very often we get the answer wrong. And so I'd like to give you a personal example from my own life. When I lived here as a kid, when I was about seven or eight out in St. John, I uh, had this great idea of what it meant to care for my community. I thought it would be a good idea for me to go out and shovel driveways and sidewalks in the winter. Right? Sounds like a good idea, right? Going out, shoveling people, snow for people, making sure that their, their sidewalks and their driveways were clear so they could get to work and things like that. And seven-year-old and seven me, I think at the time, thought that that was a great idea. The only problem was that when it came down to it, I was actually trying to hustle my neighbors. Because, see, I thought it would be a great idea, hey, I'm going to go shovel, so what I'm going to do I'm going to shovel their driveway before I tell them. I'm going to shovel their sidewalk before I tell them. I'm not going to ask them for permission. I'm just going to go do it, and then I'm going to go knock on the door and ask for money. How do you think that turned out? It didn't really work. I think it took me three or four houses to figure out that if I wanted to make money while doing this, if I wasn't just trying to care for the community, if I was trying to make money out of this, then I needed to ask first. And I didn't at that time and maybe still don't quite understand why they were so upset when I'm knocking on their door at 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday asking for money because I shoveled their driveway. See, we need to know what caring for the community looks like. We need to know what it means. We need to know what Scripture says about it. And so as we're looking at this, as we're studying this, and as we've been looking at it and studying it uh, together as, as elders um, in the past few months, we've come up with um, putting some meat, an idea of putting some meat on what care for the community looks like. And so this is what it means, is caring for the community. As a church... We believe that living out the great commandments and the great commission includes caring for those in need. Therefore, we seek to show godly love and compassion both within our fellowship and in our community here in Highland. We accomplish this through intentionally striving to meet both physical needs, food, clothing, and shelter, and every person's underlying spiritual need for right relationship with God. And so this idea of caring for the community, it comes, again, from the pages of Scripture. Specifically, looking at what Paul teaches, uh, we find this in the letter uh, to the Galatians, in Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. It says this, Let us not become weary in doing good, 
For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. All right, so we know that Scripture talks about caring for the community. Again, what does this mean, though? What does care mean? What does it mean to care for the community? And so, according to Scripture, care is about concern. Care means thinking about and then looking after. Care is about provision. It's about providing assistance when it's needed and when we can do so. And so looking at what Scripture teaches, there are two main aspects to care. Two main aspects of what it means to care that we can see in the Word. First, we see that true care for someone is motivated by love. True care is motivated by love. And we see this especially in the examples of God's care for his children. Matthew 7, 9 through 11. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? See, as our Father, as a Father, God delights in giving good gifts to his children. It pleases him to do so because he loves them and he wants them to find joy in him. And so to care for, to be truly concerned after and desiring to provide for someone, this has to be first motivated by love. And second, we see in Scripture that true care in love seeks then to meet needs. Again, we see this most clearly in in God's example in Luke 12, 29 through 31. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. See, the Father's care for his children means that in love, he gives them what they need. He meets their needs, specifically what they need for their own good, especially when they're seeking after his kingdom, his righteousness, his will and purposes in the world. When we are seeking after him, when we are seeking to be his true children, true disciples of Jesus, God lovingly cares for us by giving us everything that we need to do so. So caring for someone then, it's an expression of love for them. To care for someone means that you're trying to help them to their best good. Trying to help them flourish. Caring means loving someone, meeting them where they're at with what they need to move forward, especially in relationship with God. And so, if we're going to be a church that is committed to caring for the community, then we have to love the people that we're caring for. And we have to strive to meet their needs. And that is where it can sometimes get difficult. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I find it difficult to love annoying people. My kids aren't in here right now, otherwise I'd be looking at them. (laughs) My wife is looking directly at me. (laughs) Sometimes it's difficult to love people who annoy you. Or, and this is probably a little bit better, sometimes it's hard to love strangers. It's hard to love, to care for people that you don't even know. But again, true care is born out of love. And so we, how do we love people? How do we love people like this? How do we love people enough to desire to care for them as we can? Well, Scripture shows us that the place that we have to start with this, our foundation, is our relationship with God. We have to have relationship with God first. And that's why the greatest commandment is to love God with everything that we are. Because when we have that relationship with God, when we love God with our whole being, we can then begin to love our neighbor the way we're supposed to. And so let's break down what I mean by this. First, We have to start with loving God 
having relationship with him because God is the source of love in this world. 1 John 4, 8, whoever does not love God or whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. See, because God is the source of love, he is the one who defines it for us. He's the one who tells us what love is, what love means, what love looks like in action. In fact, we can only truly love our neighbors as ourselves. We can only truly care for the community that we're in, the way that God desires when we first love him. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. So first, we understand that God is the source of love. Second, we have to understand that this command to love others, the command to care for our neighbors, this flows from the command to love God. We can't love our neighbors as ourselves without loving God first, without being wholeheartedly committed to him. The reason why loving others comes after loving God is because it's only through loving God with everything that we are that we can be equipped to love others the way that he desires. Look at this example, 1 John 4, 7 through 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So what scripture teaches us is that true love, truly caring for our community, truly loving our neighbors as ourselves, this comes from our relationship with God. It comes from knowing God for who he is and enjoying him for all of his goodness and mercy and love and sacrifice. Knowing his heart, his will, his desires. Because when we know him, when we love him, when we seek after him, then we begin to understand how he views our neighbors. That he sees them as his children, as he sees them as, as lovingly made, as his image bearers, in his image and likeness. And when you begin to understand this, when you begin to understand that caring for your community is about treating others with love, treating them with that dignity and respect and concern that they're due as fellow image bearers of God. Love comes more naturally when you recognize the value and the worth of your beloved. And that's true both of God and our neighbors. So we see that care for the community begins with our relationship our love for God. We have to be committed to loving God first. And so we are a church that defines itself as being about caring for the community. And we've seen that care is shown in how we love our neighbors. And that loving neighbors, again, is only truly possible when we love God first. And so now we have to ask and we have to answer the question, what does loving people look like? What does caring for the community look like? Well, first we see Jesus giving us the answer to this question. Again, it's our foundational passage on love in Matthew 22. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And see, this command from Jesus, it really, it captures the essence of what God revealed and commanded people throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament as well. God commanded that the nation of Israel, his chosen people, were to love their fellow Israelites, their neighbors, foreigners, the oppressed, the weak, the downtrodden, everyone. One example is found in Leviticus, Leviticus 19.18. 
Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And we see this command to love our neighbors repeated throughout the New Testament as well. Not only by Jesus, but the other authors as well. In Galatians 5, 13 and 14. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbors as yourself. All right, so again, we've seen scripture after scripture telling us that we need to care for, that we need to love our neighbors, our community, that it's important. We know that this is commanded by God, but still, when it comes down to it, what does this love look like? What does care for our community look like? It's one thing to say that you love your neighbor as yourself, or even claim that you are willing to lay down your life for someone else. But that's all, when it comes down to it, it's, it's theoretical, it's abstract, it's not connected to the way that we generally live our lives. I mean, how many of us have actually been in the position where we needed to be willing to actually lay down our life for someone else? So what does this mean then, and how do we do it? What does loving each other, what does loving our neighbors, what does loving and caring for our community, caring for them, what does this look like in practice? Especially when Jesus expands our definition of love, our understanding of love, and places an even greater weight of responsibility on us. In John 13, 34 and 35, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my, my disciples if you love one another. See, this love that we're supposed to have is supposed to be of such a caliber that it's immediately recognizable to others. Outsiders looking into our fellowship should know without a shadow of a doubt that we are followers of Christ by how well we love each other how well we love our neighbors. And this love that we have to have for each other, it is caring, it is explicitly caring. It's connected to concern and providing for the needs of each other. We know this again because of how Jesus describes love just a few chapters later in John 15, 12, and 13. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. This is a weighty responsibility. And again, if we don't understand what it means to care, to love for someone, it can feel abstract, it can feel disconnected from us, especially this part about laying down your life for your friends. I mean, does this mean that we're supposed to go out and try to find people that we can jump in front of to catch a bullet? Or jump in front of to make sure the car hits us instead? Are we supposed to volunteer to be executed for people on their behalf? What does loving your neighbor as yourself, what does being willing to lay down your life for your friend, what does that look like? Well, fortunately for us, as we've seen throughout our study of the Gospel of John, Jesus knows us. He knows that we need help in, in taking these things from theory, from knowledge and information into practice. And he knows that we generally learn better from example, from practical application. And so in his wisdom and his love, he actually gave us the perfect example of what neighbor love looks like. An example that we can all learn from and put into practice in our own lives. This example, like so many of Jesus' teachings, is given to us in the form of a parable. And hopefully you're thinking of this parable by now. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10, we see Jesus teaching this way. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and we saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of ro- hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So I don't, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but in this parable, in this response that Jesus gives to this lawyer, he actually flips the script. He doesn't actually answer the question being asked. See, the lawyer's interest in in pressing Jesus, he was trying to find out who his neighbor was. And he was doing this because he was trying to narrow down the list. He was trying to make it as exclusive as possible. If his neighbor was only the Jewish person who was living on his left or his right, then hey, this is an easy command to keep. Jesus isn't interested in limiting the object of love. We see here his focus is not on telling us who our neighbor is, but on defining what love looks like. He wants to show us all how to be a good neighbor, how to care for our communities, not to identify who our neighbors are, because really, when it comes down to it, what Jesus is telling us here is that everyone is our neighbor. And so Jesus gives us this parable of the Good Samaritan. The actions of the Samaritan man, finding a stranger, someone he had never met before, they show us, they exemplify what this command to love our neighbors as ourselves looks like. And so let's look at an example and see what neighbor love really looks like. First, neighbor love is sacrificial in nature. Loving your neighbor as yourself will often require personal sacrifice. We see this in the Samaritan in in meeting the needs of this stranger. He was willing to give of himself, his time, his resources, his money, his comfort in order to care for this other person. All the while not even knowing the man's name or if he would ever be able to respond or repay him. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Neighbor love is sacrificial. Second, neighbor love is concerned with meeting needs. Neighbor love meets needs of others, physical and spiritual. The Samaritan looks to meet the physical needs of this man, these very real, very pressing needs of this stranger. His immediate concern is to meet the physical needs that he sees before him. Matthew 25, 35, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. So neighbor love is sacrificial. Neighbor love is concerned with meeting needs. And finally, neighbor love is the embodiment of caring. The Samaritan's actions here show that he wasn't just trying to get rid of the guy. He wasn't trying to just do the bare minimum. He wasn't trying to just put a dollar in the cup and then walk by. He was actually concerned for this man's welfare. He cared for this man. He showed love and concern for someone who was sick and hurting. 
Matthew 25, 36, I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. See, in this parable, we see what neighbor love looks like in action. This is what it means to care for your community. This example gives us what we need to understand about what laying down your life for someone else in a practical way looks like. It's not just being willing to die for someone. True neighbor love, true care and concern is about being willing to sacrifice, to give of yourself, to meet the needs of those who, for whatever reason, are unable to meet their own needs. Again, both physically and spiritually, especially as we see throughout Scripture, the refugee, the sick and wounded, those who are oppressed and downtrodden and seeking after justice and mercy. Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. All right. So it's one thing then to say that we are a church that is committed to caring for the community. It's one thing to know what caring for the community, what loving your neighbor as yourself looks like in principle. It's another thing then to actually go about doing it. And So the question then that we now need to answer is what do we need to do to do this, to put this into action? What are the steps that we need to take? What are some mindsets that we need to develop so we can be better and better about fulfilling the purpose that God has given us, to be a church that cares for the community? And as we're getting close to closing, I'd like to give you three principles, three main areas that we need to focus on if we're going to be a church that truly cares for our community. First, I know this sounds simple. I know that it may be beginning to feel redundant that I keep coming back to this over and over again, but we need to start at the beginning, and that is with loving God. It's impossible to love your neighbor as yourself, to truly love and care for our community the way that God desires if we don't love him first and foremost. If you don't love God with everything that you are, you are never going to be able to love your neighbor as yourself because you won't know and you won't value your neighbor the way that God does. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, as a church, as followers of Christ together in community. We need to be focused on loving and growing in our love for God. We need to be focused on spending time with him in his word, learning who he is and what he desires for us, speaking to him in prayer, recognizing and acknowledging all of the blessings we experience from his hands on a daily basis growing in maturity and sanctification that he lovingly provides us. And as we do this, as we grow in our love, in our understanding of what God desires and how he sees his creation, a byproduct will be that we grow in our love for our neighbors as well. Because again, we will begin to be able to see them and value them the same way that God does. Each and every person in this world is valuable, is worthy of love and respect and care because they are also, just like us, image bearers of God. 
So foundationally, we start with loving God. Second, out of this love for God, as we grow, we need to seek to treat others as God treats us. Loving your neighbor as yourself means that you attempt to show everyone the same loving kindness, the same care and concern that you actually experience from God. A love that always looks for the benefit of the other person. In essence, what this means is that we as a church need to be committed as a fellowship together to the golden rule. Since we know that God only wants what is best for us and gives us what we need to serve him. This is our standard of how we desire to be treated. We desire to be treated the way that God treats us. And this then is the standard by which we should interact with others as well, with how we should show them love, both in our fellowship and in the world. Loving our neighbors is as simple as treating them the way that you want to be treated. Treating them with the same love and care and respect that you receive from God. And if we were simply committed to doing this, imagine what our fellowship would look like. Imagine what our outreach, what our inreach, what our ministry to the community would look like if we were committed to just treating others the way that God treats us. If we're going to be a church that is identified and committed to caring for the community, We need to be intentional about putting this principle into practice in our fellowship. Matthew 7, 12, so in anything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So we need to be committed to loving God. We need to be committed to treating others by that golden rule. And then finally, third, we need to be intentional about showing love to others. About actually being loving instead of just saying that we love or feeling love towards others. Brothers and sisters, loving your neighbor, caring for the community. This isn't about fulfilling some sort of obligation. It's not about crossing something off a list. It's supposed to be the natural and joyous response that we have to the love of God that we've received from him and the love that we have for him. Love isn't just sentiment. It's caring commitment and action. It's doing, it's serving that which we love for their greatest good. And we as a church need to be intentional about expressing love for our neighbors. We need to be intentional about caring for this community. We need to be looking for ways to show love. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. And that, of course, means that we as a church need to be committed to meeting physical needs, to caring for the community physically as we can. But caring for the community is foundationally about showing them the love of God. Because our concern is not just about the here and now, but the eternity as well. We need to show them the love of God in our physical care for them as well. So that they can, through our actions, see how much God loves them. So they will desire relationship with the one who inspires our love and our commitment to them. We care for the community so that our community will come to love God be saved. Because love, it's not limited in supply. And it shouldn't be limited in expression. Now I know that we are limited 
creatures. We are limited by time and geography and resources. We have limits to us, but this doesn't mean that we should be intentionally limiting our love and our care for this community. Instead, we should seek as we are able, as God has gifted and blessed us, both as a church and individually as his children. We must be intentionally seeking out opportunities that God brings us to show our love, to care for each other in our community as God desires. So that again, hopefully, our community, the people around us, the world around us will come to know and love and worship and glorify God through the love we've shown them. As a church, as God's church here in Highland, Indiana, on 41st Street, we understand that part of our God-given purpose, our mission, is to care for the community. To be true to that purpose, we have to be committed to loving God with everything we are. We have to be committed to loving our neighbors as our very selves, with the very same care and concern that we receive from God. And we have to be committed to seeking out ways to show, to express, to put that love into action. This can and it should take many forms. It can be as simple as giving a cup of cold water to someone who's thirsty. Many times it's going to be more involved. And it will include significant time and effort Maybe even sacrifice from something as simple as raking leaves and mowing lawns to something more like paying for a hotel room for someone to something like opening your house up and letting someone come stay with you, paying a medical bill, buying someone a car or paying for their car insurance. These are things that are expressions of love and care for each other. But in all of this, We can never forget that caring for someone means being concerned and working towards meeting their needs, both physical and spiritual. And the greatest need that anyone, anyone has is the need for Jesus, the need to know him in salvation. So in caring for the community, we are trying to show them the love of God, through how we love them. Both in action, by meeting their physical needs, and in word, by showing them, by telling them of their need for a Savior. Again, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Let's pray. Father God, as always throughout this month as we have been seeking to recommit ourselves to this fellowship that you have given us, I'm so thankful, God, for the gift of purpose, of mission for us to to be able to know what it is that you desire for us, what it is that you have for us, and even to begin to know how to go about doing that. We pray, God, that as we are committed to as a church, to care for this community, that you would continue to bring opportunity for us to put this principle into action, that we would, as a church, be committed to showing love, to actually loving our community for the purpose of showing them the love, the infinitely greater love that you have for them. So God, let us be a church that is defined by, let us be a church that is known by how well we love each other and how well we love this community in which you've placed us. All for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray.